Welcome back to the show. Returning this week is Jem Carson. He is the founder of Kai Volatility Advisors. He was on my show last about a year and a half ago, and it was a very popular episode. A lot of you have been asking for him to return. So Jem, thanks so much for joining me again. Great being here. Thanks for having me back. Well, let's start with sort of a, a zoomed out assessment of what's happening in the markets and with the economy. Um, right now we're hearing, you know, employment is strong, inflation has come down, we're sort of coming in for a soft landing. Is that the case? Oh, it's way more complicated than that. Everybody likes to write a very, very simple narrative. Um, you know, uh, inflation, we put it up there as one number, uh, CPI, right? Um, and the reality is it's not that simple. Um, the uh, there are multiple forces at play here uh, when we talk about inflation. Uh, there's structural inflation, uh, and then there's cyclical, right? And what do I mean by like what's the difference? What do I mean by that? Well, cyclical is is tied to the business cycle, right? How's the economy doing? What's happening to GDP, right? Um, that is what we've been primarily focused on for the last 30, 40 years because the Fed had the luxury. Of, of being able to just uh, manage inflation using monetary policy and, and managing the business cycle. The problem is they drove dramatic inequality through that process. And gradually over time, people kind of got more and more disenfranchised. The younger generation in particular, who is labor, right? But when you come out of college, you are labor. You don't have it for the most part, right? Uh, uh, structurally, that, that generation is labor. As you get older, you get more capital and you eventually become more capital. You tend to be that way. That's the tendency at least. And so this younger generation has been kind of screwed for lack of a better term for 40 years. They have uh, had to be, you know, had, have seen labor share decrease of GDP and had have seen inequality uh, dramatically increase. And this is part of what's driven Bitcoin. You and I talked about this and the, and the desire for that from the younger generation, in my opinion. But um, importantly, that inequality gets to a point where it's almost a tipping point and people say enough is enough. And with politically, with baby boomers starting to die off and millennials on down being the next demographic bubble coming to more political dominance, you're starting to see dramatically more populist policy. People focused on this inequality and saying, hey, what are we doing about inequality? You're starting to see labor rights. You're seeing a lot of other things um, come to the boil to the surface. And those things, once they start, um, it's, it's part of another cycle, another, another, another time. And those things are structurally inflationary. Basically, if as a people, we decide politically to prioritize median outcomes, meaning how is the, not the, what is the average, but what is the average person doing? Sounds like a very similar thing, but very different things. If the average, uh, the average might be much better if you send 99% of the money to the top and those people make infinite amounts of money, but all the people on the bottom do less well, right? But if we instead prioritize median pe per people's outcomes, that is actually less efficient for GDP, but maybe better for us as a society. And if we decide to do that, if we decide to focus on inequality and fixing some of that, uh, populist policies are very inflationary. They're more fiscal policy. Uh, there's more um, uh, protectionism. So there's less, uh, you know, uh, ability to, to expand globalization and, and lower costs, um, et cetera. And corporations do better in that environment, uh, but people don't necessarily do better. And so if we decide to do that, that's structurally inflationary. So we've had a very structurally inflationary period um, and it's increasingly so. In the face of that, the Fed is trying to control that with cyclical pressures and slowing the business cycle. And not surprisingly, it's taken longer than you might expect, right, for inflation to come down as an effect of that. And core inflation has been higher. And the components tied to labor and other things have also been, been very sticky. So we could get a recession here. We could get a real slowdown. And they're starting to see that, um, you know, looking forward. Um, while at the same time, actually seeing inflation continue to be above 2%. Um, and that's kind of what we've seen. Now, people are saying that's a soft landing, right? We've been talking about a landing of any kind for years and haven't gotten it yet. But, um, you know, so you can argue if we're even landing at all. I would argue that we're not, like that inflation hasn't come down yet. It will continue to be, uh, the structural components will continue to be strong. And even if we can slow it to 2% or lower in the next you know, year or two via a recession, uh, 
the, the, the question becomes, well, once we're in a recession and you start simulating again and you get the business cycle kind of uh, more positive again, what then what happens to inflation? And that's what happened in the 1970s. They, they got orig the original bout of inflation, which was 7% plus, they got it down to 2%. Um, William McChesney Martin did that via that slowing in the business cycle. But all of those things, ultimately, when they pivoted and started stimulating again, came back and took inflation to 12 14, 15%. And then Arthur Burns came in, slowed it to 5%, right? There was a deep recession, maybe even 4%. I forget exactly how low it went. And then it went to, you know, 16. So um, the, the key here is there's structural inflation. And so, uh, you know, there's a push pull between structural elements and cyclical. And I think, um, you know, they're calling it a soft landing. Um, I'd call it stagflation. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Neither of those, uh, those sound very different, very different optics, but I think that's the reality. We're in, a, we're in a very kind of difficult situation. The Fed's very much in a box um, as we go forward here. Well, I know that you've talked about how there's sort of a new regime that's in control and we will no longer go back to these sort of ZERP policies that created a lot of the um, wealth concentration that you were alluding to. But I guess my question is, you know, Yes, the Fed has been tightening, but on the other side, we've we've moved into fiscal dominance. They're spending, spending, spending. Our interest expense is growing. I mean, how long can you actually maintain that? And how do we not go back to the zero bound just in order to, um, you know, feed the economy the drugs that it it craves so much and has gotten so used to over the past decade? Yeah. So zero percent interest rates. In a structural inflationary period, if we were to do that, we would get runaway inflation. Why? Two reasons. One, um, if you lower interest rates below, uh, uh, you know, the inflationary rate, people and expectations of that inflationary rate are are still there. People will start to to borrow money to 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 invest in anything that's pinned down, and that will increase the prices of those things. So that's one. Two, um, if inflationary expectations take hold. Right. Um, uh, you know, people will increase inventories um, as well and bring demand forward itself. Um, and, and so both of those things will create more inflation in the economy. So the key is long term rates. What are what's going to happen to long term rates? Um, and, and my view is, is ultimately that 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 longer term rate will will continue. We're starting to see it now will steepen. Um, and if that happens, uh, we're. We're, we're, you know, you can't lower interest rates back to the zero bound without runaway inflation. It'll just be feed on itself. It's a, it's a cycle. Um, the other problem is, you know, people say we have to. I mean, uh, I, I actually don't agree with that. And there are a lot of big investors about, that will disagree with this. But, but um, my view is actually that in the United States, um, you know, we're not just like in any other human being. Uh, you know, it's not like we have a balance sheet and we have to make sure that we follow. Um, uh, you know, and this doesn't sound fair to your average person. This sounds like, well, how, how can the U S just keep borrowing money? It, 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 it's, it's ultimately, you know, it has to have a, a fiscally more conservative route. The reality is uh, the world is in my opinion about power. Um, and, and, uh, if you have a very powerful, uh, individual who is, uh, 10 times bigger than everybody else, 10 times more intelligent, whatever, it doesn't matter how much money they borrow. They can tax their minions. They can do uh, whatever, as long as they can maintain their power. And again, that's not a popular opinion. I don't think that is fair, right? Um, but the reality is the U.S. is uh, dominant um, in, in every facet um, of, of, of the world, both in terms of military, economic strength, uh, GDP. Um, uh, you know, we're an island on the other side of the world that, ha you know, has, has some level of, of safety, uh, all the commodity inputs that it has is self-sufficient. And all of these things won't last forever. Uh, power wanes. Entropy is the way of the world. But, um, you know, in the history of the world, empires don't fall from their, their peak. Uh, and empires fade away um, over time. And uh, the reality is that Rome taxed all of its provinces uh, for uh, 1,500 years. And, um, again, it's not fair. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, I'm not in America, you know, uh, I grew up all over the world, but the reality is power is power and real politic is what matters. And at the end of the day, if the Fed, I ask you one question, I think Natalie, you and I may, may have had this conversation offline at some point, but I ask one question. And this really is what drives uh, 
my, my view is if tomorrow the Federal Reserve hit a button and our debt went away, if they literally just hit a button and said, we're taking all the debt, uh, all of our debt is gone, which they can do, by the way. It's that simple. Um, what happens to the U.S. dollar? And the average person would say, oh, the dollar will collapse. Like there'd be all loss of faith in, in the U.S. government and U.S. debt. Um, and that's what people thought when, you know, the dollar got taken off the gold standard, right? Basically the same thing happened. We monetized our debt in 1971. And at first people lost, it was bedlam panic. Everybody started selling the dollar and then go look at the graphs. A couple of weeks later, what happened? Massive dollar strength, right? And it actually helped the U.S. You know, we led to a, we, we moved to a, a period where, where people said, oh, well, we need safety. Please, U.S., take my money because there's, there's a crisis here. And all that. that's what we've seen throughout history. So the, the, the truth of the matter is the U.S. has the ability to control its own fate. And uh, I do believe that what that does mean is there will be some type of debt jubilee, some type of um, uh, removal of some of this debt, uh, which the U.S. will do at some point. It may do it in a, a very kind of optically much more favorable way, right? Uh, much like it did when we took our, you know, when Nixon took us off the gold standard. That was a debt jubilee, but nobody really talked about it in that context. And there's ways to go about doing this and monetize the debt. So we will monetize our debt. That I think is inevitable. Um, but uh, if you think we're going to stop spending that money, um, and you could argue, by the way, that the U.S. shouldn't. The U.S. shouldn't stop spending because if it's not going to have the cost of a weaker dollar, you know, much like Japan, you should monetize your debt. Um, and, and that's what they're going to do. They're incentivized to do that. Politicians will spend, uh, you know, uh, that, that's just how things work. Um, but that does not need, mean necessarily that we need to take things, you know, down to the zero, uh, you know, uh, the bottom and in interest rates once again, in my opinion. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer's not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. With the industry's most experienced leadership team, innovation is in their DNA, and it shows with a quarter of their workforce dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. And now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. You raised some really, I mean, interesting points. Everything from the question of the, the dollar status, which I agree in the sense that, what, 80% of the of global transactions are conducted in the dollar. Most debt is denominated in, in the dollar. It's so entrenched, um, underpinning the entire financial system. So I think it would take a long time for that to unravel. Although I think we are starting to see signs of that, especially in a world of you know digital monetary technologies. Um, but it's fascinating that also in 1971, yes, we went off the gold standard, but we had Kissinger going overseas, creating the petrodollar um, you know, agreements. And so basically creating this new demand for dollars in exchange for you know the oil and military uh, protection. And so all of these forces coming into play that sort of took the place of what the gold standard was. And here we are 50 years later, and we've been able to print and sort of export all of our inflation elsewhere. Um, and we've obviously being the global reserve currency, we have that dilemma, which results in the hollowing out of the middle class and, the, and moving the industrial base overseas. We had globalization. It's exacerbated sort of that wealth concentration. And now we're coming to a point where you're right. Populism is increasing because people are like, what the heck happened? You know, my, my children are graduating from college and they can't afford a house. And, you know, no one is uh, able to afford a, a re retirement or like a $400 emergency, the studies say. So we're in this place where it feels like the fabric of our society is sort of coming apart at the seams. And yes, it will probably take maybe a hundred years for the whole empire to come down. But don't you think we're headed in a direction that is 
I don't know, it's, it's sort of, um, losing all of the, the status and ec economic strength that America was known for that brought so many people here, the economic hope that people longed for, because here you're working harder and harder for money. That's just getting debased faster and faster. And the money pools with the very small percentage that own all the capital. Go tell the, uh, you know, the greatest generation, right? The 1930s and 40s, um, that this is a difficult time. Go tell people from the 1960s who felt, you know, were amidst the Vietnam War and the race riots that this is the fab, the market, you know, the world is coming apart at the seams. It always feels that way, right? And uh, it feels like the world is going to fall apart. But um, my belief is that this is, this will be a time of, uh, of, of crisis, um, that there will be much like during those periods, um, very difficult um, things that transpire, but that will lead to crisis leads to uh, growth and change. Think about all of the positives that come, came out of those periods that wouldn't, we wouldn't be here in this situation if it weren't for those people going through those, those periods. Those are when we, that is the clearing of the underbrush essentially so that the, the forest still survives and, and keeps on going. And I think that's what we're going through, right? We're going through a period of difficult rebalancing because we haven't cleared the underbrush all these years. And it's going to be even harder because we've put it off. We've tried to smooth the business cycle, get rid of crisis. Why, you know, yeah. crisis is bad, right? Well, guess what? You can't. If you mute crises, if you don't clear the underbrush, eventually the whole forest can burn down. So it's good we're getting to crisis. It's good that we're dealing with these things. And yes, it will be hard and it will feel like it is the end of the world. But America and what it stands for are not on the brink of collapse, despite how it feels. Um, and if anything, if we went on for more decades and 50 years without a crisis, I would argue uh, you're at more risk of, of something like that happening. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I guess I'm concerned because America is no longer the net producer that it once was. Other nations have sort of taken that role. And some of these themes were brought up actually by Jerome Powell when he was on 60 Minutes on Sunday. He talked about how he's concerned about the long-term future, that this this debt and the fiscal path that we're on is unsustainable. And he, he sort of alluded to the power that we've had being the world's money printer, the fact that we're the global reserve currency and after World War II, all of that strength and power has been centered with us and we don't want to lose that position. So Talk to me a little bit about how do we move forward when this debt, especially at higher interest rates, is growing increasingly difficult to service and we're not willing to cut spending or entitlements? Yeah, Powell talking about something or me talking about something are different uh, because Powell has a vested interest. He has his role is actually not to actually analyze something and tell you it's the truth. It's to convince you to support what they stand for. Um, so uh, I think it's important to not take what he says at face value. Um, he is, uh, he has, uh, he's trying to achieve certain goals. And one of those goals is to maintain the faith in the U S dollar and the confidence and uh, in the, that, that underpins the exorbitant privilege and uh, whether or not that's going away, there are periods where people may lose faith in short terms and, you know, and, and, and dollar flows can go one way or another. Um, so he, uh, you know, wants people to know that the government is, uh, finds this important and they will, they will stand uh, behind, behind and be, you know, make fiscal responsibility a priority. They're not, and, and that's not going to change. Um, uh, and, and the reality is, uh, as it gets to a point where they won't, they'll deal with it in other ways. They'll monetize and they'll deal with it, like, as I mentioned. Um, that said, uh, you know, there is a, a desire for the populace and the political, and he, believe it or not, is a political animal. Now you could argue otherwise. He is, uh, you know, the Fed is always uh, infiltrated by politics, whether they like it or not, because they are there actually to represent what the people want. They're part of government in a sense. Um, and so, yes, you've heard him talk a lot more about the average person and as the average person getting helped enough, um, are these things, uh, you know, the, there's been a lot of criticism about the Fed. He will need, he needs to maintain the importance of the Fed. Uh, that's his role. So he wants to also come across as being compassionate and also playing uh, 
not just sending money to the rich, even though he really doesn't have an option here. He can control monetary policy, which can only be a lever to help the rich. So point is, I, I, I would take everything he says with a grain of salt. Um, and uh, I think ultimately uh, his role is to kind of push back against some of these things and say, we do care. Uh, you know, we are uh, we are going to be fiscally responsible when at the end of the day, uh, this is not me being cynical. The, the incentives of the system are such that and the constraints that he has are such that nothing will change in that regard, not in a meaningful way. Um, we are down a path that is political, ultimately, that people uh, want certain things. And, and that is ultimately what will lead to this continuation of this regime change. Um, that means we can't go to 0% interest rates. We, he can't respond to certain things in certain ways um, uh, you know, w- without some political backlash. And I think he knows that. He knows that. And that's why these things keep being the things that, you know, uh, as the mouthpiece of the Fed that, that continue to come to the surface. So I don't know if I answered the, the full question or, or kind of, but my, my view is uh, we can talk about what he's saying and analyze it and, and say that, oh, yes, he's right or wrong. But I don't think that's the point. I think the point is, what is he saying and why is he saying those things? And he's saying those things because of his job is to push back against these things and try and maintain some level of strength and confidence in what he's doing. Well, I, I know that he's really trying to be Paul Volcker. And you wrote, um, the last time I had you on, you had this really fascinating newsletter about how everyone lionizes Paul Volcker, but they really don't know the history, the other um, you know, Fed chairs. And so I'm kind of curious how you think things are going to play out from here, um, going back to the notion of whether we're going to have a recession or not. I guess f- for me, and I'm not a financial expert, but I just don't understand how you can pump the system with so many trillions of dollars, you know, ignite inflation, and then tighten and hike interest rates at the most aggressive pace that we've had in in decades. And with all of the um, the moral hazards that were created and all the misallocation of capital when the money was so easy, I don't see how we don't get potentially a very damaging recession. And I know they try to taper over little things happening, you know, with the regional banks, but um, how do you see this going forward? And what does that mean for, for the markets and assets that people might be following? Yeah, I mean, great, great question. Uh, the, the moral hazard is real. Um, and we've seen that again and again. And uh, we've created a system uh, that is a bit of a, a Frankenstein system because uh, because of all the, you know, zero percent interest rates and sending everything kind of to the top. Um, the fiscal response um, is alive and well and will continue to be so. And that will lead to more, um, like I said, structural inflation. It's, it's kind of uh, inevitable in that regard. Um, and to your point, expanding monetary, you know, in, increasing uh, interest rates and contracting monetary policy as a response um, is putting things in balance. I kind of often call this like a, a sumo market, right? Or, uh, you know, think of it as, you know, if you have two little guys pushing up against each other, they may go nowhere. And if you have two sumos, they'll also be going nowhere. But the potential energy is not the same. The, the pressure in the system is not the same. Mm. And, uh, you know, we have a, a system with massive amounts of contrary forces pushing against one another, trying to hold things at bay. And it's creating a, a VIX that's very contained and a, a view that things are very stable. But that's all that it takes in a sumo market is a little slip, right, for two massive bodies to flow, fly in opposite directions. Um, you know, think of it as a, a fault line, right? Um, mm, same yeah. thing. Um, and so, yes, to your point, um, there is a ton of potential energy in this system. Um, uh, does that mean we're going to have an earthquake tomorrow? No, not necessarily. Um, does that mean the potential for an earthquake is increasing? Yes. Hmm. Um, and I think you need to think about it in that, in that context. Um, that said, markets, things take longer uh, than you expect because the policymakers are aware of the potential energy of the system. They're sitting there trying to stabilize these two sumo wrestlers and make sure they don't fly in, in every which way direction. At some point, the, the sumo wrestlers just get too big and eventually uh, something, you know, some some little thing on the floor is enough to like yeah. blow the whole system up. Again, a bunch of bad metaphors, right? But the point is is, is that there's tons of potential energy in this, in this system. Uh, the, the monetary policy response, the massive fiscal response um, uh, creates uh, creates a lot of uh, 
you know, different mismatched liquidity that's holding things at bay. Um, but it is also going to create uh, the net effects of that are, are this regime change, which are tons of flows within the system moving in very different directions. And that's not just within the U.S. That's uh, cross global, right? We're shutting down borders. We're, uh, we're creating a, a competitive uh, world environment from a very cooperative one. And during periods like this, um, you tend to get um, big winners and big losers, not just globally, but internally as well. Um, and that leads to a lot of some people aren't happy when they're big losers, right? Um, and, uh, and that leads to conflict. And that leads to conflict internally, which we're seeing, and that leads to conflict externally. Um, and that can be global war, which is the first thing that comes to mind, right? There's a reason I alluded to the last several times, right, um, that we've seen global war and, and, and how they're related. That leads to commodity scarcity and people using what they have as a, as a lever against others, right? Think about the OPEC crisis of the 1970s, right? And it leads to a lot more uh, people pandering to their political, uh, you know, uh, the, the, those in, 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 uh, the, that, are, that are demanding certain things, so more fiscal policy. And, and more fiscal policy leads more, more inflation. All of these things are inflationary. All of them are, uh, are, tend to be um, a bit more dangerous uh, in the world and, and leads to crisis. But again, as I mentioned, those crises ultimately help resolve a lot of the buildup and the reasons we got here in the first place. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, if things go well, we get some reform along the way. Um, and so we can last another 40 years and not just last, but strive and, and grow and, and uh, you know, do the things that, that we've been able to as, as, a, as a people and as a, uh, as a planet for 40 years now. Well, you know, some analysts are forecasting that eventually we're going to go over this cliff. We potentially will have a massive crisis. We could have another 2008, go into another depression. Others are actually um, totally on the opposite side of that. They, they say that, you know, Uncle Sam's going to keep spending. We actually might go into a crack up boom, a melt up. Um, what, what do you think? Because I've actually heard you talk on some shows about how you think there might be a, a blow off top. Equities have been doing amazing. I know that the a lot of the energy is concentrated in the Magnificent Seven in certain stocks, but I mean, all, recent all time high in the S&P 500 and people are like, yeah, the stock market's fine. We have that soft landing. Yeah, I don't I don't love that I have to always refer to the 1970s, right? There's other periods to, to refer to as well, but there, it's the one that people most understand. It's the one that's most recent, right? That kind of falls under this uh, type of uh, framework. But the, but the reality is it's the last time, 40 years since we've had structural inflation. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we look at that period, what happened during that period? And again, this is different in different ways. And I can get to, to why this is different. Like our debt. <laughs> like our debt. But again, I think that actually matters less, honestly, okay. as I mentioned. But, uh, but uh, the, the introduction of derivatives, the introduction of, uh, you know, the, the length at which we were had interest rates at zero and the malinvestment, which you, you mentioned. So there's like significant differences. I don't want to say well, we're going to follow the exact same model, but history rhymes. Um, and, and the reality of the situation is what happened in the 70s is um, we lost over 14 years, 70 percent of the value of our money. Uh, as an investor, like if you, if you invest in the stock market, that's what you lost. The market went nowhere in nominal terms. So that's kind of yeah. a, that's kind of a, uh, a, what I call nominal illusion, right? The reality is markets actually, you know, you lost 70% of your value. They did that because that's politically the most palatable path to, to let the people think, okay, you didn't lose, you know, things aren't great, but you didn't lose all your money. Well, you did. Um, and ironically, in the 1930s and 40s, before the Fed had, when the, when the Fed was still tied to, it had just come about and then it just was tied to the gold standard, they didn't have the ability to create nominal illusion. So, um, you know, they actually lost money. And, and if you look at it in real terms, the losses were the same over that period. It was about 70%, but it was through deflation and market collapses, right? And so, You'd argue the Fed has, has found a way to smooth out that and deal with kind of deal with the masses so they don't, there's no panic as much and kind of work out of it over time, which makes sense. And, and it's arguably the, the better way to approach things, you, you know, instead of yelling fire in a room and having a massive deflationary crisis to kind of right. to manage things. But that's what's going to happen again, right? I mean, we have a problem. Uh, we have to 
kind of monetize. We have to work through it. Um, and, and so we're likely to do that via uh, a structurally kind of overtime inflationary period, which kind of A, will um, in some ways monetize the debt on its own, right? Um, but B, markets are likely to have um, uh, that kind of an experience, which is, uh, you know, as interest rates go higher, what happens? Well, demand for equities goes down because there's an alternative. The demand for assets in general goes down because there's less money floating around because it's more expensive, right? If, if interest rates are 15%, you can't borrow money. There's less money chasing things. So less money chasing assets, alternatives to that higher risk premium. All these things make assets less interesting and less investable. Um, the, in, 19, in the 1970s, at the beginning in 68, um, the PE of the S&P 500 was 23%, or 23, not, not 23%. Went down to four and a half in 1982, right? Margins were, were at, at, the, at the time at record, you know, sound familiar? Any of this sound familiar? Um, and, and margins collapsed during the 1970s. Why? Because interest rates were high, deglobalization, cost of commodities going up. Sound familiar? So... The, the reality is that you don't have to have a crash today, tomorrow. It doesn't have to be 08. It doesn't have to be 2000, uh, 2001. That's what we think about because that's the most recent things that we've experienced. But what you can have is just a, a market, a stock market that is a very much, and risk assets broadly that are as a whole, very increasingly less attractive, increasingly less interesting where profit margins decrease while still GDP is actually okay. This is the crazy stat. I think I may have mentioned this last time, but in, from 68 to 82, real GDP growth was higher than it has been in the last 30 years. Hmm. But the real return of assets was negative 70% in the S&P 500. Whereas in the more recent period, with GDP growth being slower in real terms, we've had you know, until the last two years, really, right? We've had about 10, 12% per average annual gains for 30, 40 years. And so this idea that the economy is the market, that the market does however well the economy does, is completely false. It has nothing to do with it. Honestly, you can argue the opposite. It has to do with liquidity, and liquidity is not necessarily tied, particularly on regime changes, to economic growth. In the 1970s, mm -hmm. it definitely wasn't. So, um, so are we going to get a crash? Is this going to, the answer is, yeah. If you step back in 14 years and we come back and we talk on here, which hopefully we're still, you know, be a little grayer, but uh, hopefully we're still kind of doing these things and around to, to, to enjoy that. Um, you know, I think you're going to be in a situation where you might see nominal assets having gone nowhere. But the reality is if you look at it from a real perspective, which is really what matters, I think this market's a lot lower. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a you know, a massive crisis or crash for that to happen. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. Next up, CoinKite, which makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. This is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. Next up, crowd health. Health insurance costs are sky high, and it's money that feels wasted if you don't need a doctor. By crowdfunding healthcare with other Bitcoiners, I get to avoid traditional insurance fees and support real people instead of mega corporations. Crowd health also works to reduce your medical bills, so the community's contributions cover more. Imagine spending just $100 a month on healthcare and investing the rest in Bitcoin. If you're interested, visit joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. You know what's fascinating, Jem, is you hear one set of numbers and all these reports in the media and on, on whatever platform you're using, and then the reality is just so much different, especially when you go to a grocery store, prices are higher than what inflation is supposed you know, it's supposedly come down, but it's really the rate of change that's coming down. But then even with like, oh, employment, it's so strong. We've added all these jobs, but 
we haven't grown in terms of income. And a lot of these jobs later, they revise these reports. It's all part-time jobs, 25% are government workers. We're basically only adding to the public sector. GDP's up, but gross domestic income is not. And, and there's this divergence there. So it's like, you don't even know what to believe because it feels like the the picture that they're painting is not indicative of what the general public is feeling. And to some of your earlier points, you know, there's this desire to, I don't know, redistribute the wealth, I would say, right? And and the average person might even vote for policies that um, are fiscally stimulatory, where it's like, give me some of my money back, I need help. And so they might vote in, um, you know, people that are promising them to help them with their economic issues. And in an election year, that's another thing that we haven't talked about. I don't see there being a crash because they're going to do anything they can to prevent that so that someone can stay in office. So what's your take on all that? Yeah, so so I'll take the last one first. Uh, yes, it is an election year. Um, uh, every election year matters. This one matters way, 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 way more than than others. Um, because we, as we enter a populist period, right, the populist is, is a political reality. And so what people are clamoring for um, is being fed to them now by both sides in a massive way. So given that's the case, what do you think is going to happen? Yes, we're going to continue to have massive support, fiscal support. Um, yeah. Promises are going to be made by both sides to out kind of fiscal the other. And that's what we've seen, you know, whether it's Biden or really kind of, you know, Bernie Sanders, AOC on the, on the left or, or Donald Trump, they're both talking about the, you know, uh, the rusted out cities of middle America, right? Um, and trying to promise uh, fiscal measures to help rebalance. And so you're going to see an election year, all that support and all that spending. Um, you know, in, in this type of uh, environment, um, what, you know, th those things aren't going to change. And, and I think that's the point, right? Um, until that rebalancing happens, uh, you're not, uh, which takes time. Right. This is why it takes 10, 15 years or so to get through these processes um, until that rebalancing uh, really happens in a meaningful way. People won't and they'll see the cost of it as well. Right. At some point, populism does have a cost. Right. Um, uh, you know, uh, until people recognize that, grow older, become a little bit more capital, uh, get some along the way benefit of that rebalance, uh, that political reality will continue to be the case. Um so I, I think some of these things are uh, inevitable. Um, and unfortunately, even though they seem like they're political whims, they are the realities of a generational uh, forces that, that exist. Um, you asked another question there. What was your other? Uh... Just kind of the, the divergence between the numbers and the reality in oh, terms the number of, the reality. Well, you know, we're told Absolutely. employment is really strong, but when you look at the numbers, it's like all part-time workers or government workers, I mean, GDP versus some... GDI. There is some level of, of obfuscation that's happening, right? There is some level of, like I talked about with Powell, like his goal is to achieve certain things. So he is going to use the numbers that matter to highlight the things that he needs. And that's what government does. But I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here. It's not like the numbers are made up or that there is a, you know, concerted kind of division mm -hmm. to kind of uh, obfuscate everything for the world. It's just more subtle. But I do think things are complicated. And people want simple answers. Do we have inflation or not, right? That's how we started the whole conversation, right? And I said, it's complicated. It's a little bit more complex than that. Here's a great example. So you're kind of, a, uh, you, you named a couple of these numbers before. We just added 350,000 uh, jobs, you know, a big surprise. But guess what? Average hourly gain, earnings haven't gone up at all. Right. And why is that? Why is that, right? It's because we're losing jobs at the from tech and certain areas that are two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollar a year jobs. We're losing a decent amount of those, and then we're gaining for every let's say two hundred fifty thousand dollar job we lose, right? We're gaining five fifty thousand dollar jobs. Right. So that makes the unemployment number look better. But that's what rebalancing is, right? That's what people. That's the reality politically. Those those five people who got the fifty thousand dollar jobs are have five votes, and the other person had one. And so that's politically popular. And you can argue in a world where we've had massive inequality, it's maybe even necessary. I don't know. Again, it's a political question, right? But that doesn't mean GDP is growing. 
And actually, it could mean GDP is actually decreasing. But what it does mean is that person that had 200 was making the full 250,000, maybe used 100,000 of it and saved 150,000. And they went and bought Google or, you know, uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA or whatever other stock, right? Um, whereas the other two, you know, in the other world, 250,000 is being spent. Everybody there is spending all of that money and that causes inflation of goods as opposed to inflation of assets. Mm -hmm. um, but inflation of goods means that the Fed has to react. And, and, you know, this takes us to where we are. So my point is it's complicated. It's not just what's unemployment doing? Are we, you know, and, and it's not that employment is a proxy for GDP. They're not the same thing. For 40 years, they basically were because we didn't have this rebalancing and the structural uh, forces that we're talking about. But it's more complicated now. And, and so we have to be, in, you know, not be intellectually lazy. We have to dive under the hood and really understand what's actually going on on, on a, you know, item by item level. And I think that's hard for 99% of the public who has no idea about 90% of the stuff we're talking about. On here, right? Um, <laughs> we're you know, helping. I, yeah, we're, we're trying to help, right? And I think that's the key is, is to not, and I think we do ourselves a disservice when we when we try to oversimplify and try and get likes and whatever with simple yeah. uh, kind of metrics. I think the truth is it's a bit more complicated, but we need to understand this idea that there's a rebalancing structurally, things are changing and numbers aren't as simple as, oh, we're getting, we're gaining jobs. That doesn't, that may be good for people broadly, but that may not be good for the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes these things are complicated. Well, you know, I mean, this is why I'm really passionate about helping simplify this information and get more financial education to the average person, because I, I just can't believe that we go through schools. And I, I remember being, I mean, I was all about my studies and I had to get good grades. I came from an immigrant family. Like I had to get good grades, right? I never learned about money printing or the history of money and fractional reserve banking and how the stock market worked. And these are the things you need in order to be able to accumulate wealth. I mean, it's so sad to see that the majority of assets are held by so few people. And to your earlier point, power, I mean, money is power. And with capital, just being able to access such cheap money for so long, it's created this massive pressure, I think, on the so social fabric of America, which once had this thriving middle class and people felt like things were a little bit more fair and equal. Um, now it's like a young person doesn't feel hope that they'll be able to have the kind of life that their parents had maybe two decades ago on one income. And so I'm kind of curious. I mean, obviously you've chosen to work and excel in the private sector, but a lot of people are looking to the political parties and to potential candidates for someone to come in and save the day. And I'm just curious, like, what do you think will help the average person gain prosperity, especially young people in a system where we are so indebted and we have created all of these, you know, crises that we've tapered over. And it just seems like it's harder and harder for the young a, a young person to accumulate assets the way it was for say their parent or grandparent and we might celebrate that hey our homes are our, our savings accounts and my house went from five hundred thousand dollars to a million but it's like is that really a good thing because once you move out you're going to find another home that's overpriced in my opinion that might not be affordable there's a ton of maintenance you have to do property taxes go up right i mean it's like why are we celebrating all this asset inflation when really it's just making a small percentage of the population super super rich and everyone else is kind of fighting over the rest i mean natalie you just made the you know populist right uh this is why right uh, a lot of your base are younger um you know, people who have feel this way and rightfully so. Um, uh, and so the response is political. Um, there's so little that you can do on your own, right? Um, as part of this, this broader system, um, you know, the, there has to be change that's made. Um, uh, and the problem is that the system is not perfect, right? The system is, is, is often feels broken and it's not going to fix it. But the reality is you have the ability to make kind of a grassroots effort to, um, to prioritize what, what, what is to that group important. But in the absence of that, you're going to be subject to power, you know? Um, and uh, life isn't fair. 
I know that stinks, right? But life isn't fair. Your mom told you that from day one. This, the way nature works is it all accrues to the top. And um, we're very fortunate that in, here in the United States that we've tried, our, our founding fathers came to uh, a realization that they were going to try and create elaborate structures to remove some of the entropy that led to this survival of the fittest only kind of the, everything goes to the top. And that's what created the, the American dream and um, some level of freedom and uh, independence that we have. And that's spread around the world. But we have to reform and to continue to maintain those checks and balances. We need to prioritize um, the uh, removal of the effects of, uh, of power and money as much as we can. If we can't remove it, but uh, you know, and I can get on a big political, uh, you know, spiel about what those like, things are. And you want to remove money from politics? Let's money say. from politics Donor. is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's a massive problem in the system. Uh, Citizens United has completely destroyed, you know, broken down the, the, the disconnect that was created, right, between power and, and the vote. Um, you know, we have gerrymandering, which is a massive problem that needs to be removed. I mean, yeah, I could keep going. There's there, there's well-known, understood things that are creating entropy within our system. Entropy is the way of the world. These things are going to happen. Power will continue to cont you know try and wrestle uh, away from from you know this th this idea of equality. Equality is not a natural construct. It is a wonderful idea that we come to as human beings. This idea of fairness, but the world is not fair. And if we want fairness, if that's what we're going to talk about, which is what populism is about, if we want fairness, we got to create and reinstill the, the structures that allow for some level of fairness. But that doesn't necessarily mean that is GDP maximizing or going to lead to the fastest progress. Mm -hmm. But we may be happier as a people and it may be broadly more equal. So we have to make these decisions. And if that's what's happening, we need to be politically involved to reinstill you know, those, those blessings of liberty. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that'll be my one political comment for the day. Cause we, we went there, but, but yeah, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. And that's why crisis is good. Crisis is good, Natalie, because crisis leads to people coming together and solving problems. We do not solve problems in the 1930s and forties. The world was united. The, the U S was united. You know why? Because we were in a crisis. And so we haven't had a crisis for 40 years and everybody hates each other and everybody's at, at each other's throats. Guess what? You know, we need crisis so we can reform and continue to clear the underbrush so we can reform, you know, reinstill the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Well, it's interesting. I think that quote um, about crisis, Rahm Emanuel, former mayor of where you live, right? Um, Government, I feel like, loves crisis because they can use it as a reason to sort of concentrate even more power and for everyone's safety and convenience, they can, you know, make certain moves. Um, but I, I would disagree respectfully with you. I've, I feel like I've lived through one crisis after another. I mean, like the tech bubble bust and then it was the great financial crisis which really affected my family i we we went through my family lost everything had to start over then we had covid and so so it's 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 interesting cuz i understand we haven't had like a global war that's you know meant um the deployment of our troops here on the ground fighting in the united states but at the same time i feel like we've had a lot of financial crises that especially young people now feel so um, disenfranchised by that they are pooling together. And to your mention of a grassroots movement, Bitcoin, definitely this powerful grassroots movement, which ultimately is trying to separate money from the state. So what do you think about that? I know we haven't talked about Bitcoin for, for a while um, since you haven't been on the show in a bit, but What's your take on all of this? Because now we have these spot Bitcoin ETFs. It seems like Wall Street is legitimizing this movement. Um, we're going to have some FASB rules changing, more corporations potentially put, putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So where do you think this is all going? Yeah, I'll start with the first question, which is, and we'll get to Bitcoin, um, is, you know, what, you know, we've had crises, to your point, um, uh, in that, you know, crises have just made things worse um, to that concept. And, and I would actually argue that 
those crises had not been very long lived and have been solved very quickly. And when I say crisis, I mean, you can enable, it's all relative. Like what's a crisis, right? But I don't, I don't think you can, you know, we look at 08, 09, and that was a year and a half. And it seemed to everybody, right, that that was going to be the next depression when you were in it. Mm -hmm. But what happened? Monetary policy came in, right? Cleared everything out, right? And solved the problem. Smoothed the business cycle. We had barely enough time to make any political changes, any major, and I would argue the ones that were made have already been kind of pushed aside again, right? There's still some beneficial things that came out of the great financial crisis, by the way. But they were, they were so short-lived and the crisis was not deep enough or meaningful enough to make real change. We put it off and we didn't clear out the underbrush. The tech bubble, again, that was just a massive, we went from a massive you know, baseline here to here and then came back down to here. And then again, solve that problem very quickly again. It wasn't really a crisis. What I'm talking about is a real crisis, right? Like a real existential crisis where, there, where the Fed can't solve our problems for us, where we have to solve our problems for us. Mm -hmm. When that happens, there will be reform because there, we won't have another choice. We'll have to come together to solve the problems. And that sounds scary, right? It is. Real crisis is real scary. It's existential. And we haven't had that. And I think that's the difference. That's okay. fair. That's fair. Um, uh, now, moving on to, to Bitcoin. I've said this before, but Bitcoin is the embodiment, almost religious embodiment of this generation, right? Like millennials on down. Why? That generation grew up with 0% interest rates, fiscal policy, monetary policy, as far as I can see, which drove a massive technology boom, right? So it's a technolo technological solution. This generation believes that tech will solve all of our problems. There's always been tech, by the way. There's always new and different, and it's always to that gener younger generation, a thing that's going to change the world. And it does. The world changes and evolves. But, um, but that idea that technology will solve our problems, one. Two, fairness, right? That, that generation has been, as we stated, screwed by inequality and the, the effects of monetary policy. Um, and three, a need to catch up, right? This it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's been this very convex kind of way to, to speculate and, and, and to throw money into to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so all those things have led to the, the interest and in, in focus on, on this thing. Now, you've heard me say this before. I have, I have mixed views on, on Bitcoin. I have both a very, um, uh, in the short term, very productive, you know, constructive view on, on, on Bitcoin and, and, um, and, and crypto broadly, because it is the religion of this generation and assets go up because people buy them versus sell them. And if you have a wave of, of belief and interest in something, it doesn't matter what it's worth or what it's not worth. It's are there more buyers than sellers, right? And there will be, in my opinion, a ready, consistent base of buyers of Bitcoin and crypto broadly um, that will continue to be there throughout the next 15 years, right? As this generation becomes a political do dominance, there'll also be generally uh, things that will be politically more supportive uh, versus not. That said, and we've seen that, by the way, right? The adoption, the interest, the, the political uh, unwillingness to, 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 to do uh, make hard decisions in terms of regulation, et cetera. Those are all very positive for Bitcoin. If we go past 10, 15, 20 years and talk past generational divides though, and you've heard me say this, and this is going to be unpopular with, with your, uh, with your group. Um, uh, every, since the beginning of time, money has not just been an exchange of uh, value. It has been a sort a, a, a ability to control and power. It, it, and, and the reason is power is power, right? You're, by the way, if you if Bitcoin be, words to become the global currency, let's say, there would be still be a desire for power to find a way to wrest control in other ways, right? This is human nature. This is competition. This is survival of the fittest. It's our. It, it, I don't love it. It's not idealistic, right? But it's the truth. And um, since the very beginning, kings and queens have controlled money and, and the exchange of it and the, and the keeping of it. There has to be a proxy, 
right? And that the entity in power controls money. That's just how it works. And the entity in power is, they control everything, not just money, but they control money. And um, the U.S. is the global superpower. Uh, or, and, the, and it's supported by the West and all the other entities that are in power. And if at any point they were to be taken, imagine what would happen to the U.S. We already talked about it here. If that exorbitant privilege was taken away, the debt would matter again, right? All these issues we've talked about would matter again. That's an existential risk for the U.S. That's an existential risk for the developed world. That's an existential risk for, ironically, the structures that support democracy and peace and all the things we've talked about that we may or may not believe in, right? If there is no entity in power, you could argue there's chaos in this world. So power isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? It's who has the power, who's controlling it. And for the entity that is in power, the superpower that is the, the West, let's call it, but the U.S. at the primary helm, there is a risk. There's an existential risk to that entity if they allow money to be taken, the power over money to be taken from them. And so I think it's naive to think that that entity is going to allow that to happen. If you think the, Ameri the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are going to, also they'll let it stick around. They'll let it do its thing. They'll let it do. But at the end of the day, if you think the U.S. is going to allow Bitcoin um, to become the global currency and for them to lose control and to lose power, again, I don't want to be cynical, but it's just not the way the world works. And so my view is long term, they will develop their own digital currency in the relatively short term. They will... Uh, take on a lot of the aspects of that are that are helpful, like the technology and whatnot. That, you know that is helpful um, uh, to, from from crypto, um, and they will find a way to adopt and, and benefit from the, the advancements that's happening through that way. But I think if you think they're going to the the, the piece where they lose the control over it um, and, and lose the control over money, um, I, I think is highly unlikely. So there is a limit to how far this can go before the powers that be, in my opinion, push back. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that it's not a good investment in the short term. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be long Bitcoin. I want to be clear, um, uh, you know, there, there is a wave of buying that will continue to be supportive broadly in the, in the, in the medium term, um, uh, you know, to long term, depending on how you look at things. But again, I think if you start looking past 10 years or so, um, there's a, and there's an upside limit to that because the more if it becomes too powerful, then it goes in conflict with the powers that be, and that becomes a real problem for it. Unless everyone in power is a Bitcoiner. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, you bring up some really interesting points because, again, over the long time horizon, I know we're going to face a lot of challenges and headwinds because you're right. I mean, this essentially is demonetizing the state um, and providing for more competition. Earlier, you kind of created that analogy and illustration of this powerful entity, right? The kind of, when I think of power, I think of big, strong muscles, you know, the gorilla in the room, but, but America does still have that position yet. I kind of see it the way really our, our presidency is, which is an octogenarian. It's like, it's like, yes, powerful in name, but sort of degenerating and, and becoming weaker. And people are kind of noticing that it's not what it used to be. Um, and I think that you're right in the sense that in the near term, the power of Bitcoin will be as an asset as opposed to as a currency. Although I, I will say I've traveled around the world and I do see people using it. It has been less volatile than some of the other currencies that exist in, in many other countries. But I think that it will first be a global reserve asset as opposed to nations saying, you know what? I'm, we're, we don't care about the dollar or the yuan anymore or the ruble. We're just going to go to Bitcoin. I don't see that happening for a long time. I think there's going to be a lot of pushback, but I think the two can actually coexist. I mean, Bitcoin and the dollar have coexisted for 15 years. Um, perhaps Bitcoin can strengthen the, the fiat currency of whichever nation adopts it. Um, some of the presidential candidates were talking about potentially even backing the dollar with a basket of commodities, including Bitcoin. So I'm just curious to see how it will play out. I'm a, I'm I'm a very optimistic and hopeful, but I, I, I agree with you in the sense that the people in power and many of them are not Bitcoiners, obviously, will want to fight back against their monopoly over money. Um, all right. Well, as we wrap up, Jem, uh, 
just give me kind of maybe three things that you want people to know if they're watching this and they're like, you know what, I want to be able to plan for my future, accumulate wealth. You focus a lot, obviously, on volatility. The VIX has not been popping off, as my understanding, unless I'm, I'm wrong about that. But what are three things uh, as your final takeaways? Yeah, I think the, a couple of the, the biggest takeaways and, and some of these we, we mentioned before are um, – Look, uh, if you're if you're looking to just be long assets and uh, experience a 40 year again, if you got one thing right for the last 40 years that that Federal Reserve would be you know, monetary policy would be dominant, um, and that we would uh, continue to lower interest rates, which they've done from top left to bottom right until two years ago, right in a straight line. If you got that right, you are inordinately wealthy. Why? Because you bought the dip, you were you favored growth all along the way. You know, you, you de-emphasized value, you um, you bet on globalization and, and the growth of China. There are so many trends that that has fed into and has been the primary driver of, right? So if you got that one thing right, really just one thing, that interest rates are going top left to bottom right and the monetary policy was going to be down and cause that, you, you've done incredibly well. Well, I think you got to get that one thing right now. Like, where are we and what is happening? And, and that cycle is turning, right? And interest rates are going, they're not saying they're going to the moon in the next 10, 15 years, but they might. And they're going from bottom left to top right. And there'll, there'll be some volatility along the way, much as we've seen. It doesn't mean, by the way, by the way, I said you got that right for 40 years. That you still got a massive crash in assets from 2000 to 2003. You still got a massive crash of 08, 09. So it doesn't mean there's not going to be volatility along the way, but the trend is what's important. So when those crises happen, then you hop back on that trend and you make more money. And you do that. So that trend now is changing. It's going the opposite way. So you need to bet on the things that benefit from that. And that is deglobalization slash onshoring, right? That's a huge, massive trend to be focused on. Government uh, betting not on uh, capital markets being the funder of things, but government. So you want to bet in things that government is funding. <laughs> whether it's defense or healthcare or infrastructure, you go down that budget list, is, right? Yeah. That's a great place to invest. Those are structural trends. The value of money is increasing. So value over growth. You don't want to be going to, to the long duration assets, right? You want to be going to who has money, money now and is generating cash flow. Those things will matter again. So a lot of the opposite things that we saw for the last 30, 40 years to some extent, but that doesn't mean you're not going to, you shouldn't invest. There's going to actually be more opportunities in this world than there were in the other one because it's a massive time of rebalancing. The key is to be focused on the right things and not just be betting passively on the S&P 500. You also need to be nimble. You need to be trading actively because, as we said, nominally, the markets went nowhere for 14 years, right? So you need, but you had 75% rallies and 50% drops, right? So you need to be active in this type of a market. This is not a passive market. So I think I just named like seven things, but that's the big trend. And that's the big takeaway to be focused on those types of things. Uh, volatility, uh, you know, um, can be can be an asset. Derivatives is another big takeaway. Allow you capital efficiency so you can get that five and a half percent year in the in, in, you know, in, in short duration T-bills and still use that collateral to make money on top of that. So there's all kinds of interesting ways and opportunities to to thrive in this type of an environment. But you need to not play yesterday's game. You need to play what's happening now and what's going forward. Great takeaways. Well, Gem, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, where can people find you? I will make sure that all the links are in the show notes. I appreciate it. Uh, on Twitter uh, slash X at jam underscore croissant. Come to our website, kaivolatility.com. You can sign up there. Um, if you're interested in investing, uh, sign up to talk to me or uh, sign up for our newsletter, kaivolatility.com backslash news and see all of our media um, whatnot as well. But uh, always, wonderful being, always wonderful being on with you, Natalie, and, and thanks for having me on again. Yeah, thank you so, so much. You know, I really do think that you're just six to 12 months away from being a hardcore Bitcoiner, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> you're converting me, at least in the short term. This show is also brought to you by iTrust Capital. iTrust lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. If you're doing retirement planning and considering adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, you can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel.
Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Coin Stories podcast brought to you by BitDeer. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. You can reach me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.